Well, good morning to you guys. Like um, Pastor Kuba said, my name is Gili Jordan. I'm from Shofar Paul, Shofar Wellington Paul, Shofar at Labak. We don't know what to call our church. Um, we merged two churches, Paul and Wellington, and so we became one church, um, a church for the valley. <laughs> we want to reach the whole valley there in, in um, Paul and Wellington and even into Franz Hook with Richard and Jolene. And we're excited about what God is doing there. Um, came, went to, me and my wife went to plant the church in Puts of Struem. And then three years back, we felt God said we should come back to Paul, specifically to Paul. We didn't know why, what was going to happen. Um, but we were obedient. We had some family members that were sick at that time and so we moved back to take care of them and and still do ministry and church and it's just been an amazing amazing time so that bit of our our history we were seven years in Potsdam Strom and like Pastor Kuba said that if you come through there still sanctified you know (laughs) you know that um, (laughs) you can do it Um, but it's an amazing place with amazing people we loved it we were very sad to go um, but we're also enjoying this um, portion of heaven down here in the western cape those of you that lived in other parts of the country will know that it this is this is sweet it's sweet being in the western cape Um, normally when our friends from port of Sturm come to visit us they're like can't believe you get to stay here (laughs) love the ocean love the mountain love everything Um, so yeah it's just an honor to be with you guys this morning um, we shared a vision in, in, the, in the intercession room that I really believe that is what, what God's want, God wants to do. Nas shared it with us and it, it's, it's this picture of a bowl that God is starting to pour over. And it's a, a picture of the congregation, you guys, that God is filling you up. That's why we prayed that He's filling you up and, and as He fills you up that will spill over into the world. Okay, and, and isn't that what we want to be? We want to be a group of people that's so full of Christ that wherever we go, we don't do evangelism or, or these things because we have to. We want to. It's, who we, it's a natural response. It's like Jesus is the best thing that I've, I've ever encountered, the best person, king of my life, and I cannot but share him with other people. But if you're like me, and I think a lot of our friends, um, you will know that life is complex. Okay, I've got five kids. It's very complex in my house. Um, It's it's not really complex. It's just chaos. It's a circus. Okay, if you want to see a circus in the Western Cape, come and join my house. Five to seven. Animal hour is what we call it. Um, (laughs) There's a few animals there. They're on the loose. Um, But... um, (laughs) <laughs> uh, life gets complex. Huh? I, I don't know about you guys. In, in, my, in my 20s, when I just met Jesus, I want you to think back on those days when you just met him. Huh? I don't know how it was for you, but like, I was, I was <laughs> zealous and passionate and sometimes really dumb in the way I went around doing things. <laughs> but, um, but then as life goes and, and we start to transition from that, for me it was... Um, starting ministry. I did a lot of other jobs before this. And I studied law, so I wanted to be, be a lawyer. Um, did my, my um, articles here in an uh, office in Cape Town and, and um, did some other things and then went into ministry, got married, amazing wife, and then the kids were added. But as we grow up, it, it seems like even if I look at my friends my age that was with me in those years that as life gets more complex and there's more relationships and we need to manage stuff and and lead stuff and and do it well and lead our kids well and have a great marriage and and be a perfect representation of who jesus is it 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 feels like there's just all these things that gets added it's all these weight that's get more and more and more and um and i think sometimes in in that complexity of life if i can call it that we sort of lose the reason we, we do life. We lose the joy, um, not necessarily up to the extent of totally losing it, but it, 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 it's almost like it, it goes away. Uh, we lose some of the fire. We lose some of the intimacy with the Lord. Um, I mean, when I was a student, I woke up and I opened my Bible. If I had a class, I'm just like, Ugh, get the next one. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm preaching to the students tonight, so I'm, I'm, I know where they are. Um, 
I mean, there wasn't someone waking up at six screaming for milk. Yeah. And at seven, four hungry um, people at my dinner table wanting wheat picks. I mean, now, now, now that's, that's my life now. At the, when I was 20, it's like, Jesus, thank you. I can spend two hours, even three if I want to. But now I'm like, if I get 10 minutes, it's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> and I think all of those things, it has an effect on us. Um, I, I'm not even speaking about difficulties like suffering, losing family members or having a hard time financially. I'm not I'm that. If we add that, then then it, it's it's a lot. So I want to read to you. OK, um, this morning I had something else planned, but I'm going to change it. Uh, I love it when the Lord does that. Um, bless him. Um, <laughs> but uh, I want to I want to share the story of the book of revelation with you guys so in in covid the when covid started i got so irritated okay this is me this is a confession with everyone saying that now bill gates is the antichrist and this is the chip and this what what <laughs> and they based it out of the book of revelation and i thought i, I can't me any i want to see what this book say for myself and I've read it before, and it's beasts coming out of the sea, and it's, and it's chips in the forehead, and it's angels and crowns, and seven this, and 144 this, and I couldn't understand anything. And so I made this, in my youthfulness, I made this declaration. I said to the church in Portsmouth, we're going to preach through the book of Revelation. I don't care if it takes us six months. We will understand what this book says because I cannot handle any more conspiracy theories. <laughs> that was like, okay. Um, and, and so we embarked on this journey. It changed my life. I, I cannot strongly state it more strongly than that. Like literally, I think I got saved for a second time. If that's possible, just check with Pastor Quibbers afterwards. Um, but I think I had to have a second baptism. But I got saved again literally in, in my room backyard in Porch of Sturm, struggling through the book of Revelation. So we had an a older couple whose kids were in our church, but this, this guy wrote a verse-by-verse -verse commentary, did a study on the book of Revelation for 10 years, and he wrote a commentary on this, and he walked us through the book of Revelation for 12 weeks. So I'm going to give you a condensed... <laughs> 30-minute version of that um, through the first five chapters. But this book blessed us. And I think the, the thing is, we must remember that the people read this book and they understood it. And it meant something to them. Okay, so if it meant something to a regional audience, it can mean, mean something to us as well. Um, so I want to um, paint you a bit of the picture why this book was written. So it's, it was written 80 years after Christ died in a, in a time where Christians were heavily persecuted. There was a Roman emperor called Domitianus. Okay, say that to your neighbor. Domitianus. We, we called him in porch Domitianus. Um, <laughs> I must choose my crowd when I make that joke. Yeah. But um, <laughs> Domitianus um, was one of the first emperors. They literally took his name out of the history of Rome. They were so ashamed of what he did that they took his name out of their history. They said he, he never existed. This was one of the most evil men that I think has ever walked on the earth. He... he um, was also one of the first guys that said that he wants everyone in, in the countries that he governs to worship him. So when they would get into the Colosseum, everyone, when he comes into the emperor box, would stand up and they would bow to him and they would say, Dumitianus, our Lord and our God, and they would bow. Okay, now that, that for us is like oh, a crazy guy. But if, you're living, if you live in that time, and you are forced to do this, then you've got a problem. If you're a Christ follower, you've got a big problem. Because <laughs> you can't say, Dumijan is my Lord and my God, and then tonight, Lord, um, thank you. I just did that because group pressure. Jesus, you know, that didn't mean everything. Um, 
So, so the Christians were faced with a very, very difficult task. What they also did is he made statues of himself and he placed it in every single town. The seven towns that is the book of Revelation is actually physical towns, groups of people that gathered, that got saved through the preaching of, of, uh, some of John and some of the other disciples. They got saved, they gathered, and then um, this, this letters to the churches was actual people. Okay, it's not, it's not, this um, it's not, it's it's groups of people that, that John wrote a letter to because Jesus wanted to encourage them. Why did he want to encourage them? Because they were persecuted, because they didn't bow to Dominicianus. So the statues, what they had to do is, if you want to work, you had to earn a labellus. Labellus was a certificate of work. Um, it's not a degree, it's just like whatever work you do, you need this to earn a salary. And so if you want this, this labellus, you had to stand in front of the statue and then you had to take some holy water, sprinkle it on the statue and you have to do this every single year. Dominicianus, our Lord and our God, and you have to bow before him. Now again, for the Christians, born again Christians, this was a problem because... And then there was an officer that, that said you did do it and then he would write out your certificate. If you didn't do that, you couldn't work, you couldn't earn a salary, you couldn't make a living. And so it was said of those times that the Christians were on the ash heaps looking for food. They were, um, there was rumors that started to, to go throughout this, um, these seven towns that the Christians were, um, they were cannibals. Because they were eating and drinking the flesh and blood of another man. It's communion. <laughs> it's, 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 in essence, what communion is, we, we acknowledge the blood and the body of another. But this rumor started to spread. And then that they commit incense because the brothers and sisters sleep with one another. <laughs> and so the people started to think that the best thing that we can do for Dumishianus and our towns is we remove these people from our midst these people that were following the way following jesus and so they started to to gather in in say, say for instance we were a group of believers in one of these towns we would gather in here in church and i want you to think of this because we read it and we're like oh yeah, it must have been bad but just think about this you gather here sing these songs glory hallelujah lord almighty worthy is the lamb and then you would go home and at the at lunch table, a group of men would go into your home, grab yourself, drag you by your hair into the streets, beat you half to death, rape your wife, and kill some of your children. And then you have to go on with life. And the, the, the officers and the police and everyone would just look away. That was the context of the book of Revelation. Okay? So, so does, it, does it make sense? Like these people were, there's a group of people in, Re, in Revelation chapter 6 that stands um, at the throne of God. Um, and John see this picture of this group of people. They, they are martyrs because of their faith. They killed in this time by the Roman officers. They killed for their faith. And they start to cry out before God. Now listen to this cry. They say, when will you, O Lord, O oh Lord, avenge our blood from the inhabitants of the earth. <laughs> now, I would think if you say that in front of God, he would rebuke you. Okay, because that sounds like vengeance. Huh? It sounds like revenge. But God, in, they knew in his holiness he has to react. Because his holiness and his justice says that he will not leave any sin unpunished. And he will bless the righteous. So they knew and they cried out in his throne room saying, Lord, when will you avenge our blood? And he would tell them, just wait a little while. He will actually respond to them. Because it was so bad on earth. And so John is the leader of these seven churches. And John is on the island of Pathmos. Okay? He's an exile. They boiled him in oil and he wouldn't die. <laughs> we don't know what to do with this guy. We can't kill him. Let's put him on an island so that no one will see him again. That was John's story. So, so they boiled him. He smiles. 
I'm still here. And then they said, okay, we don't know what to do with you. We're going to take you to this island of Pathmos. And they say from that island, you could see the seven towns, the seven churches. He's the leader, apostolic leader over these towns. And he's praying for them. He knows the situation. He's asking God, would you intervene? They are slaughtering your people and you're doing nothing. Why is that? And, and, and then he has this revelation. That's where the book of Revelation comes from. He has this revelation. And I want to read to you portions. Let's just remember. And this is what I hope this morning. That, that the complexity of life. And as we grow. And we know church. We know the terms. We know the lingo. We know all these things. But, but, but John saw Jesus in a way that he's never seen him before. That's my hope for us. He, he sees something of who Jesus is like he's never seen him before. John is the disciple that was on his head on the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper. He was the one that, that wrote a whole book and three more. Okay, that's John. He was the disciple that said the one whom Jesus loved. He wrote that about himself. This guy knows Jesus. They say in his last days, he preached this one message. He said, just love one another. Just love one another. He was the apostle of love. He was actually called that. That's John. He knows Jesus. But his reaction in, in Revelation chapter 1 is different. Okay, I'm going to read it to you. Verse 12. You can, if you've got a Bible with you or something, just open it there. We're going to read 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. I'm not going to read everything. <laughs> but we're going to skip through some of it. So, Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. Remember, there's the seven towns. The, verse 9 says, the vision of the Son of Man. He sees a vision of Jesus. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. He's on this island. I don't know if he's alone, but, but everyone that was in exile was on that island. So, I don't think he was in good company. <laughs> okay, you hear me, like an island full of prisoners. I think you should just find a place to stay and then just stay by yourself <laughs> and be quiet. <laughs> um, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning I saw seven golden lamps. So he sees this vision. I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man clothed with a long rope and with a golden sash around his chest. He sees Jesus. The seven golden lampstands is the seven churches. It's churches that Jesus started. He's saying, I am the head of the church. It belongs to me. These are my churches, my people. I will protect them. I will deliver them from this evil. But the message that and the way that in which he encourages them is sweet. And it's going to be sweet to, to you as well. Um, Clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. He, he looks, Jesus displays himself in his glory and he looks like a judge. Okay, that's, that's, that's the picture that he sees. The hair of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet, his feet were like burnt bronze, refined in a furnace. That burnt bronze is his day to judge. That's what that means. He's there to judge, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. That seven stars is the seven leaders of the churches. He's saying, they will not be scattered. I have them in my control. His right hand is the hand of control, the hand of authority. Um, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, listen to his response, I fell at his feet as though dead. John that knows Jesus sees something of him and he's like, I've never seen him in this way. The way in which he just is he's revealing himself to me is, is new. It's different. I, I've seen him as the, the, the priest. I've seen him in prayer. I've seen him heal the sick, but the way I see him now that he's here to judge is the new way. I see him in, and I fall as if dead. And then Jesus touches his shoulder when he's laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. Now Jesus is speaking to him. I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. 
Jesus is saying to him, this is who I am. Don't forget that, John, because you might forget it if you look around you to your circumstances. You might forget that I am in control. I am the one that holds the keys to life and death. Not to Mishihanis, not anyone else. I am the one that's in control. I have the keys of death and Hades. It says, I, I, I am the one that sends people where they go after death. I determine the eternity, and that is more important than just physical death. Right there for the things that you've seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. Okay, and then it, it, it goes on to explain the seven stars. So Jesus reveals himself to John, the leader of the seven churches, who's being persecuted, slaughtered, raped, abused. These people that's hungry, the Christians that's suffering, and he's saying to him, I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I am the one that have the keys to life in my hands. Isn't that powerful? I wish I could see this every morning in my room. <laughs> How would your life change? Huh? I don't think we have to tell one another, let's do evangelism. It's actually laughable. It's like literally, it's the funniest thing. If we see this picture, this is the picture that John saw. Him in all his glory and all his splendor, white, white hair, eyes of fire, knowing that I'm going to look into those eyes one day. If I could see that, if this projected, I'm going to, the scene in Revelation 4 and 5 is even more. If you see that, you don't need someone to tell you, hey, it's going to be fine. You're actually living in a great time. Yes, you have troubles, but it's, there's people before you and after you that's going to have troubles as well. So, so the way in which Jesus is starting to tell these people how to get rid of their suffering is by saying, keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. That's what he's saying. So, Chapter 2, the seven churches. You know how this, this letter is written? It's not the most important church to the least church. It is, it's the way in which you would walk to deliver a letter. It's, it's, it's in, in that order. That's how they chose what church to write to first. It's seven groups of people, actual people. Now, what is very interesting, and this is a sermon, two sermons on its own, is the way in which Jesus reveals himself to every church. It's different. The first church, oh, I'm not going to go through it. Ephesus, there's some of them that he's mad at because they compromise. Because there is groups of Christians amongst them that's, that do the, I'm going to bow because my family needs food. It's a responsible thing to do. And I'm going to compromise in this way. Jesus will understand and he sharply rebukes, rebukes them says, I don't understand. I'm your first love. Turn back to me. To every church, he, he does the perfect conflict management. He, he compliments them. says, I love this about you guys. I love that you work hard. I love that you, you, you hate those who speak evil. I love that you, you've endured until the end. I love that you've got little strength, but you're still holding on tells them and then he says but i've got this against you you've forsaken your first love or you allow this this prophet jezebel that thinks she's a prophet to to minister in your midst that you allow this and you allow that you you allow the compromise and he 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 rebukes them now if i was if if i want to say this with respect but i think we will think the best way to encourage these people is to go and sit in their pain and, and, and to, to, to make it easier for them by saying, I understand that you're doing this, it's fine. He never does that. He, every single church, every single group of people, he calls them higher. He tells them, remember who I am. Remember that I'm the first and the last. Remember that I'm the one that holds the keys to life. Remember that I'm the one that gives you the crown of life. Remember that I will be the one that show you how to overcome. Every single church, he says it in this way. He doesn't, he doesn't comfort them in, or in their compromise. 
He, he doesn't say, I allow that. Ach, it's fine. He, he calls them on it and say, I need you to repent of this. And then he gives them a warning. Now listen, this was the biggest thing about the book of Revelation. Jesus will not warn you of something if, if he doesn't do it. He's not into that. <laughs> he's not, a, he's not like, like, I don't know if you father your kids like this, but hey, as jy nie, I, as jy nie, I goed gaan optel, ja, gaan ek drrr, en jy weet, soos jy het nie nou eindelijk die energie om al hierdie goed te doen nie, maar jy gooi die warning al buiten. Okay, that's what we do. We warn and then we're slow to react. He warns and he says, I will do this. If you don't repent, I'll remove your crown. If you don't turn back to your first love, I'm going to take the lampstand and, and make... So he's literally saying to them, if you don't turn back to me, I'm closing your church. <laughs> and, and so we, we as, as... I don't want to speak about the judgment of God because that's also a thing about like on its own, but I really do believe there's a partial judgment from the Lord that that sometimes he hands us over, he removes his grace, and he hands us over to the thing that we so desire. That's not him. And he's, and he's saying, see if this is working for you. And then when you're ready, return to me. That's frightening. He works with us in that way, and he says that he disciplined those whom he loves. And so he will discipline. Okay? He will discipline. But I'm not... You have to warn you about his discipline. This is just a, it's a bystander. I want to just show you how, 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 how he's prepping them to turn their eyes back to him. He's saying to them, the compromise is going to be short, short pleasure. The, the, the sin that you allow, that teaching that you do, this and that, this is not going to bring you true life. The only thing that will bring true life is when you turn your eyes back unto me. And so... Chapter 4, 2 and 3 is the seven churches. Then chapter 4, eh? we're going fast to the book of Revelation. Eh? Um, chapter 4 is, is the, the, the vision where John comes to heaven. And then he sees this throne in heaven. We sang about that this morning. <laughs> you guys know that scene. That, this, that scene is from this, this verse. So he sees the throne of heaven. He sees one called the Ancient of Days, seated on the throne. That there's 24 elders. I want to sketch you the, the scene. There's 24 elders with crowns. There's angels flying, creatures flying all over the place with eyes on, on the, the front and the back. Okay, scary things. If you have to see them at night, you'll be like, <laughs> you'll run. Okay, and all of these creatures do one thing. When when they, they over and over and over again cast their crowns and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And they see that God in His splendor and glory has ultimate authority because there's thunder in heaven, there's a loud voice in heaven, and there's this unending worship in heaven. That's chapter 4. Now, um, Chapter 5 is where I want to land. Chapter 5, theologians write, is when Jesus arrives in heaven after he's been crucified. And I want to read to you some of this. So, so John, let's, let's read it. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll. Written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. This scroll is in the right hand of God. John weeps because there's no one that can open the scroll. On the scroll is written the plans and purposes of God. He sees the most horrible, horrendous things. He sees beasts coming out of the sea. He sees women drinking the blood of the saints on the beasts. He doesn't cry. He only cries when he sees the scroll that's closed because the people of God cannot open it because they cannot see what's the plans and purposes of God and he starts to weep. This is the, the, the importance of this that it should be opened. Okay, It's sealed with seven seals meaning it's perfectly sealed. Uh, the book of Revelation does what in Afrikaans it's called cipher symbolic. 
I don't know what's in English. It's, it's, it's cipher symbolic. No, it's a... <laughs> and Port of Sturm, we didn't worry about the English. Okay. Um, um, meaning that the, 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 the 144 means 12 and 12, the Old and the New Testament. All the signs of the Old and the New Testament. The 144,000 signs, it's not 144 literally, thousand it, it represents the 12 of the old testament and 12 of the new testament all the saints of the old and the new testament will stand before god okay seven means the perfect number that it is totally sealed with seven seals so every 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 letter has got a symbol and i saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice this is the question in heaven okay and, and this is what I would also love to play in my room every morning. Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? This was the easy question asked in heaven. Who can open the scroll? And then no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. It's not who is strong enough. It's not who's good enough. It's who is worthy. The only one that can be worthy is the one that, that can access and take it out of the hand of God without wrestling him. You can just take it. So there's no one. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Speaking to John, she said, John, don't weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So this elder taps John. I see him in my head on the floor weeping. Face on the ground. And he, this elder comes and says, John, you don't have to cry anymore. We have someone that can open it. The, the lion, look at how he describes it. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, what do you suppose John is going to see? A ferocious lion. Like, okay, I'm going to see this lion. He's going, to, oh, he's going to be so mighty. And then he turns around and he sees the following. He says, and between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. With seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth, saying he's got full authority. He can see everything. He knows everything. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp. This is the bowl that, that also a bowl that we've, we've seen in intercession. But this is another bowl in heaven, which is filled with the, the prayers of the saints. The golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain by your blood, you ransomed people for God, for every, from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Isn't that powerful? So John wants to see this lion. He turns around, he sees a slain lamb. Now, the lamb is slain because he was just crucified. Have you seen us? Was he all op a skaal plaas gewees? When his lammetjes geslag word? Er was niks meer krachteloos as a geslagte lammetje nie. It is it's the weakest, one of the weakest things. And, and God is saying that, that even my weak, in my weakness, I will destroy the power of the enemy. That the power of God is in the humility it's in the meekness. It's in the brokenness of Christ and what he did on the cross. And that is what brings us freedom, redemption, righteousness. If this didn't happen, we'd have nothing. Nothing. We can gather here this morning. We could have been a, ro a roll ball club. Or a rugby club. Or a chase. Whatever you guys want to be. But we could have been a, just a group of people that gathered, but we had no power. No ability to change anything. No, no, no means to get rid of our sin. And because of this sacrifice, 
of Jesus on the cross. And John that, that sees it, this message, this is what I want you to, to hear. This message liberates this group of Christians. Okay? So much so that they are willing to sacrifice and suffer. So they, they receive this letter and they hear it and they understand it and they like, I want to give everything to the Lamb. Okay, you understand? Like, I want to, I want to, I, I don't care about not eating. I don't care if my family got slain and slaughtered tomorrow. I don't care about how next week is going to work. I am going to continue to follow this man who John writes has changed eternity for us forever because he is the only one that's worthy to open the scroll that's in the hand of God that displays and gives us the purposes of God for humanity. He is the only one worthy of my worship. I cannot bow to fear. I cannot bow to the suffering. I cannot bow to anything else. This is the man that I want to worship forever and ever. It was said so much so that this inspired them that the families would, would come into the Colosseum. They would, the, the, the mothers and their children. Okay, If you've got kids, just listen to this. Mo and we've seen this in the movies. But mothers with kids. Dumishanas would organize, this is the entertainment for the Romans. Let's slaughter the Christians. And they would get the mother and the kids in the middle of the Colosseum and then see them. They thought they would run around frantic in, in, away from the lions. And they would bow in the middle, start a worship service. So whatever comes through these gates, we're going to see the real lion right now. <laughs> we know that. So we choose to worship him. I don't know how you get your kids to do that. <laughs> I don't know if my kids will say, Papa, I come a little. To my son, we're going to go to Jesus. It was so, it, it was so in them that the Romans started to make paintings against their walls. They called it a Rico. That's where Rico coffee comes from. Um, <laughs> but a Rico was actually coffee that they took and they, they painted these people that they couldn't figure out. We have slaughtered them, we have abused them, we've called them cannibals, we've said they're guilty of incense, we've said we've harmed them in every single way, but still they will not forsake this man. That even so much that as we gather in a Colosseum to watch them to be slaughtered, they bow to worship him. Now, if, if, if this message can... can so inspire this group of people. I think that if we could see this every morning, this, this lamb that's seated, this scene in heaven that everyone is worshiping, and the only one that's worthy to take that scroll is this lamb. If we could constantly remind ourselves about this, I think we'll live a supernatural life. I think we'll, we'll turn our eyes from our circumstances We'll turn our eyes from our difficulties, from our suffering, from whatever is bad. And I know there's, there's real trouble and real bad things. I experience them as well with you. Some of, them, some, of them, some of us have got more than others. But this is the message that Jesus said to this church. This will get you through this. Turn your eyes to me. Worship me. Isn't that powerful? Yeah. Worship me. I, I don't know if you're going to be slaughtered. Some of the churches, he literally said to them, you will be persecuted until the end. So they read this letter when they gathered. And this letter from Jesus said that we are, he's not going to stop the persecution and the slaughtering. But he's saying, do it with joy. <laughs> Just think about that. If he has to write a letter to this church, what would he say? He is the head of the church. I've seen, I've seen this the last few, few months as well. In, I've been helping them in, in Stellenbosch. It's the church of Jesus. This church, this group of people belongs to Jesus. And I know your pastors know that. But we do belong to Jesus. And he will counsel us and tell us. And if we're compromising or doing all these other things, then then this morning we need to turn. 
we're focused on our suffering and it, it determines the lack of zeal and joy, we need to turn to Him and remember again that this is the good news of the gospel. That He's given us the gift of righteousness in the, for your sin. Uh, that Martin Luther said, it's the great exchange. There's no better deal on this earth than you can give your sins for a gift of righteousness. Because of this act, Jesus gave you access to heaven. The scripture says that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. This, this, picture, you will, this picture of the 144,000, it's a picture of the saints that's dead and it's still going to live. They're already seated around the throne of God. It breaks your brain. It says that we have, we're in dual, like we, we live in two places. We're here right now, but all of us, if we're in Christ, we're also seated in heaven. Isn't that powerful? We've got a place there in front of him. And our response on earth shouldn't be different than there. That when he's revealed, when we see something of him, we bow and we worship. And we said we want to surrender our life to this man, this lamb of God. That people that slaughtered, they will still love him. They still love him. You know what was the response of the first church? It's not in the book of Revelation. But the response of the, of, of, of the early church, I'm going to end off with this. The response of the first church... They did a study, I, I read a study that they said, uh, uh, we want to determine why this church grew so much. Was it the, 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 um, the special grace? Was it the, um, the presence of very gifted people? Was it, was it just the phase? And they said the study showed that it was none of those. The church grew by 30% every single year. So this group of people, the, what was very interesting is that this group of people gathered in their homes. They would invite the lost into their homes. They would share a meal with them. They had no strategy, no formal way of this is, we're going to do evangelism one to two o'clock in the Cape Gate Mall. Okay, <laughs> and I know we do those things to just see how Jesus moves. I, I do them as well. I need to remind myself about the goodness of the gospel that there's sinners that need freedom. There's people trapped in demonic things that need freedom. And this story, this picture is the only thing that will, will, will help them. Not me giving them a hug or a high five or a smile. Like we sometimes think, I'm not going to use words. I'm just going to smile. That's, that's not in the Bible. Okay. <laughs> The gospel, the proclaimed message of Jesus is what's helped them. Not your smile. Yeah. I, I know it softens them to hear the message, but it, it, it's the message. It's the story. And so this first group of Christians, the church grew by 30% every single year. And I think this, the stat, it's around 300 after Christ, but the stat is that they were growing so much that they would have been by, by 350 the year 350, they would have been, um, I th I'm, I'm going to get this wrong now, so forgive me all the actual artists and stats people, okay? Um, but they would have been more than 60% of the population would have been born again Christians. How did they do it? There's no special anointing, no stadium crusade uh, evangelism, nothing. The normal believers were so convinced of this message and, and the goodness of God because they could behold the beauty of Jesus. They could see it because when they prayed and His presence, as we prayed before, they were so convinced of this. They said, we need to share it with everyone. And how are we going to do it? We're not going to just, you know, have these mass gatherings. We're going to invite them into our, our homes. We're going to have meals with them and we're going to tell them about Jesus. That's what they did. Simple. And it was so effective, it worked 30% every year. You know what happened? Again, this isn't good for, for church. Um, but they legalized Christianity. This is the enemy in his, in his very cunning craftiness. They legalized Christianity. The, the emperor said that this is state Christianity. We're all going to be Christians. We're going to 
baptize them when they're small, and then we're going to all be Christians, and we're all going to do this. This is this, He actually had a good idea in the sense that he saw that this is real, and he tried to use his power to, to, to institute it. So, so what happened is the gatherings that were not permitted and had to happen in homes and groups of people that gathered and did life together in homes moved to, to big gatherings only. And that what happened in the home was lost. And I'm, I'm one for the big gatherings. I'm one for Sunday church. I see it in scripture as well. I, I, I've, I preach every single Sunday in a church, except my off Sundays. Um, but I believe in church. Okay, with, with your, I do believe that this is the way God wants to, to um, do it. But I also think He wants to redeem our homes. That, that that will be, our homes will be a place where we train. This will be a house of prayer. Our, our house will be a house of prayer first. We don't just come here and do intercession on a Sunday if you don't do it at home. Okay, that's hypocrisy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but we don't do evangelism because Pastor Corbus think it's a great idea. We do it because we're so convinced of this message that we invite people around our table. And come what may. Okay? <laughs> Meaning that you don't know how they will respond. Or what they will say. I, I heard this story about another pastor that said that he invited his neighbors. And um, his kids never heard these kinds of words before. They were called names they've never heard before. And he could tell them afterwards, this is because these people don't know Jesus. And they had a picture of them on their refrigerator and they prayed for them every single day. We pray for them. They will be saved in the name of Jesus. We see their pictures. You know what a testimony that was when, when they got saved? That couple. He said his kids were never ever the same again. They saw the power of the gospel. The story. In action. It changed someone's life. And they could see how this person that came cursing basically some of them. Cussing in front of them. How their life changed forever because of the power of the gospel. And it changed their home. It changed the way they live. That is a house of prayer. It starts at home. It's a, it's a small missions base. Our homes are small mission bases. Use your table. Use your dinner table. Okay? Lock the kids in the room and use the dinner table. I'm joking. You, use, use your dinner table. This is the place where we train our kids. Okay? This is a, also a message on its own. We don't... We don't... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Ons verruil nie ons verantwoordelikheid. We don't swap or, or outsource, that's the word. Our responsibility to educate our kids in the ways of God to the school. Okay, you are the primary educator. And they will look like Jesus if they see it in their home. I know we get rebellious kids. I work with them all the time. But at least we try. We give it our best shot. It's a missions base. It's a worship center. Our homes. Our dinner table is the best evangelism strategy there is. That's what the first church did. And so cunning that just one law brought, brought the, the power of the home. It nullified it. So that people do not gather anymore. We've got it in our culture. We do small groups. I mean, we, we, we struggle, and I mean this with all respect, we struggle together once a week. <laughs> Go and read Acts 2, 42 to 47. They said they met daily, having communion. Why is communion important? I'm reminded of the blood of Jesus, the body of Jesus that was broken on the cross for me. I'm reminded of it every single time when I do it, when I gather with my friends. And we all say we, we, we honor him. And we will use this story to bring people into our homes, into our church, into our families. We'll build relationships. Sometimes, because church is so nice, we just do relationship here. And we need to love one another. That's what scripture says. But we need to have, have lost friends. We need to build relationship with lost friends. I remember we did a campaign with a 
uh, with, and Annie won't mind me saying this, with Shofar Joburg. And Shofar Joburg had this evangelism campaign, six weeks, we're going to invite our friends to small groups, I had this whole thing um, going. And, and after week three, we said, how's it going? They said, it's not going at all. So like, okay, why not? They said, no, we don't have any lost friends. So, okay, well, it's going good because you realize you don't have any lost friends. So next year, this time, come the campaign, let's be intentional about our friendships and reach lost people. I, I enjoyed so much. Werner Huber, one of the pastors in Shafar Armanis, uh, preached in Stellenbosch um, last Sunday, and he said, this is this, I'm going to end with a story. Um, he said, I know I'm, this is the second time I'm ending. Uh, <laughs> I'm a real pastor, okay? Um, <laughs> but uh, he, he told the story where he planted church in, in Secunda, and he, he felt like he was a missionary to the rugby club. He was 29, he weighed 79 kilograms, because he did the Cape Epic, and he's a big guy, and, and he knew God is calling him to be a missionary to this town, and he loves sports, so he thought, I'm going to be, this is my harvest field. And so he picked up 25 kilograms so that the harvest field will not destroy him. Um, and he remembers sitting in, the, in his car before the first practice and saying, Jesus, I don't know what I'm doing. I've, I've, I'm 29, I've played rugby, early 20s. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm just rugged. I'm not, I'm not really feel really ready. He says they did practice and he, he's never heard preaching like this before on, on the field. Like these guys just use words that he, he, he's never heard before. But then come the time where he says, let's pray. <laughs> and the guy that said, I'll pray was the guy that had the most foul language. Like, he's like, I'll pray. And he's like, okay, you know, let's pray. And he prayed. And then he saw this one guy that had a had his cell phone in his pocket the whole time when they were exercising. And he's like, why are you exercising with your cell phone? Aren't you afraid that it's going to... He says, no, but my wife is 40 weeks pregnant, and if she calls me, I need to run. <laughs> she might have a baby any time. And, um, and he, after the, 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 the practice, he thought, I want to connect with my, my harvest field. I want to connect with these guys. How can I do that? I've got a family. I've got responsibilities at church, everything. Uh, how do I do that? So he said to this guy, why don't you drive with me to the game on Saturday? He's like, I'm going to have three hours with this guy in the car. It's like, okay. And this guy said, that would be so nice. Then said, if your wife phone, we can, we can go. I'll take you. He's like, that's so nice. Thank you. And spent three hours there and back. Spoke about everything. And in the end, literally just before Secunda, he said, his friend said, you, you know what? But random. You know what? My wife says we've got demons in our house. Now, he's been praying for, for this friend and asking, Lord, would you give me just a, a small doorway in to share the gospel? And he started to speak to him. In, into, he started to speak into that. Pre, like, share with him. That couple came to church on Sunday, gave their lives to Jesus. They're still following the Lord. And so he did that with a lot of the guys. And they, they, that guy that got saved was the biggest. I was a little by it on Sekunda. I was a great player in Sekunda. Later, like, I had knuckle busters. I had a car in Slan by the pubs. This is a villa. It's a vault. And he was one of the. the you, don't, you don't mess with him. Everyone knew. You don't mess with Niels. This is his name is Niels. You don't mess with him. He'll beat you up. And Niels got saved, plugged into church, marriage changed, life changed, community. It's intentional. There's, there's, he didn't have a dinner table, but he had the space of his car. And he used what he had because this message, the power of the gospel inspired him so much that he said, I cannot not share this with other people. I don't think we should just do events like it's something we do. I think it should be an overflow. Yeah. This is the bowl tipping over. Like this is this. I cannot not share this. Can I pray for us?